Uh, we'll call the uh, committee of the whole meeting to order. Adoption of the agenda would be the first item. Mm -hmm. On adoption, all in favor? Motion's carried. A couple of delegations here today. I believe uh, Rob, Roberta Stevenson is here from the BC Shellfish Growers Association to update us on the shellfish industry. Welcome, Roberta. And Thank you. You can take the podium. And okay. We have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation. I will be quick, especially because I'm pretty confident that everybody here knows a lot about our, our industry already, so I don't want to bore you. In fact, we'll have Matt go through my slides. I know you're all well-educated and, and fast readers, so we'll let you read those slides instead of me. But uh, we have been making this presentation far and wide on Vancouver Island recently. We've given it to all the rotaries, to the Cumberland Council, to the Parksville Council, Campbell River, and we're making our way up and down uh, our local communities. But most importantly, here in Comox, as you probably know, we moved our office here from the time of seven years ago, and since then have been participating in this community in a big way. Uh, it's a perfect setting for us as we're looking out onto our farms, and also, of course, I've chosen to have a home here. My children have a home here. My um, executive director's assistant and communications manager Matt Wright has a home here. He has children in school. So we've invested in the Comox community and we believe that this is a great place to live. And as you know, our shellfish products are recognized worldwide. In fact, the demand for our products has never been stronger. We have sold out a product. What a nice thing for us. The price is higher than it's ever been before. But make no mistake, the world is becoming a more and more complicated place for us to grow these animals. Just today I am returning from Portland, Oregon, where shellfish growers from all the west coast of North America got together and discussed some of our common concerns with the ocean degradation that we're suffering, such as the pH changing in the oceans, such as urban runoffs, such as, such as, such as. Our list is very long. But make no mistake, how things were and how things are aren't the same anymore. So here in Comox Valley, we protect your ocean out front by doing everyday water quality testing. And we're the first people on the block to go to any meeting about anything to do with anything that might put our ocean at risk. Because we need that ocean clean, and we need a full plankton for our animals to eat. So uh, the farmers are very passionate about their issues. And on the top of our issues, I want you to notice that the Raven coal mine to us is our biggest threat in this area. We are growing $28 million worth of product right out here, just here in the Comox Valley. And we see that as our number one risk. And as the days march on towards public comment period, we are trying to get the message out loud and strong that this comment period is going to be very brief. We expect our communities to do their due diligence, to learn, educate themselves <coughs> about the risks, the benefits, and how they stand on it. To that end, I want to tell you that we asked the Coal Corporation three years ago to put up a bond to protect our industry, to perhaps have some sort of assurance for these farmers that are at risk. That was not agreed to. We also asked for more competent and complete testing of our water here so that we could see any changes that might come later on. That has not been done. That has not been done in a way that is transparent and makes us feel comfortable. So at the end of the day, the board of directors that I work for, 11 business owners in the valley, have asked me to come here and make sure that you all know that now their answer is, the only risk they're willing to take with these guys is called zero risk. That's the risk they're willing to take. We have not had our conditions met, and as I said, we're just not willing to put our industry at risk, nor are we able to, uh, in the future, market our product worldwide like we do right now as being grown five kilometers from a coal mine. I, I think of Comox Valley as the breadbasket a place where we're proud that we grow so many interesting kinds of foods. And we know that when we give our shellfish festival here, PR, and we bring in those 2,000 people to eat our products, they come here because there is the food thing going on. We should be really proud of that. Bain Sound is a bread basket. It's a place that we all share us. The Comox First Nation is very actively farming shellfish fronting here. 
They recently bought Aquatech Seafoods and are opening a seafood shop in their own name. This is very exciting for us. They can grow the product, they can process the product, and send it out to the world. We are businesses in your community. Okay? We're here for a long time. We've been farming these animals in this region for a hundred years. Go figure. We'd like to be here another hundred years. And I'm confident that everybody in this room would like to continue to know that they have food to eat right outside their front door. To that end, I want to pass around, and, and you can keep a, a list of all the community groups who have shown concern about this coal mine. We feel we are making good traction. But make no mistake, there's many things out there that lead us to believe perhaps it's a done deal. We worry about this. Um, and uh, as I said, we're just looking to you to show some strength and support. The ideal situation for us would be to see the Comox uh, Council do the same exact motion, somewhat, that the CBRD committee did on November 27, 2012. And I pass around a copy of that as well. Okay, and can we keep this? Yes, please. In fact, we, we can get more copies for you and we have it electronically. But we should be proud of that motion being uh, put out. When I presented to the Cumberland Council the other day, they quickly stopped me and said, wait a minute, you know, you're, con you're talking to the converted. So on Monday when I go back, I'm pretty confident that they're passing a similar motion as that one. I think that uh, Courtney will also show that strength. That's how confident I am that our list is growing rapidly of people who are feeling worried about this. Now, don't make a mistake that we're anti-business because we're so not. This is the first thing that these shellfish farmers have ever opposed, ever. They are, are all businessmen, quite rednecky in their own way, and this coal mine is just too close to the beach. Five kilometers is not enough of a safety margin to have it here. Now, as I said, I mean, marketing the valley for tourism and food when we have a coal mine nearby is going to be a tough call in its own. I really don't know how we will do that. People all around the world recognize Fanny Bay oysters, all the different oysters that we have, all the different seafood. So, um... I guess maybe I have to do some kind of report to show that loss, but I haven't yet, so it's on the list. Here's a clam that's from the beach fronting where the mine was, and there's a clam nearby where it's not contaminated by, uh, by the same uh, ill effects. Okay, so when we show that visual in the flesh, people really get it. You cannot market a black clam to the world that's grown below a coal mine. People might say, well, you know what, we had coal mines here before, and we also had oysters growing here before. Yeah, we did. The world is a different place now. The public is not willing to eat food that's not super safe. The, the regulations and guidelines for growing this food is, are very rigid. So how we used to live and how we live now are two different worlds. One of the reasons I say that I worry that it's a done deal is that the Comox Valley Economic Development Group recently put this out in the Times Colonists. Invest here. And one of their bullets, bullet number three, is because we have raving coal mine. Excuse me, is this a done deal? Do we need to feel worried? You better believe it. Putting an ad like that is just wrong. Okay? We're supposed to be doing due diligence and going through a process here. Now, this is going to turn into a political thing, have no mistake. And what a shame. Are we going to vote for what party we believe in based on who's in favor of the coal mine or not? The NDP have made it very clear that they're opposed to it and that they would not allow it. I think it's a shame to turn that into an election issue. Rather, it should be based on good science. Okay, but now it's gone beyond that. Now it's going to be a political decision. And uh, to that end, I thought we'd close off with how much fun we have at our Shellfish Festival here in Comox every year, for which we thank you all for all your support. And uh, hopefully we can continue to keep feeding everybody all this great food. Thank you for hearing me. I know you know the topic well enough that I don't need to go on and on, but I do really appreciate the moment. Okay? Are there any questions from members of council this time?
Go ahead, uh, Councillor Price. And I, it's a good point you made about the Fannie Bay oysters. Someone was telling me they were on the east coast of the U.S., quite down south, and there on the menu was Fannie Bay oysters. Of course, yeah. Yes. So I'm hearing that there is a very big concern amongst the growers that uh, this could be... Uh, this is a motion passed by all our, our community of growers, which is 160 family farms, <coughs> a board of directors of 11 people, and the motion says no. Zero risk, zero tolerance, no. Well, that's my words, but they, they're, not, they're not going to negotiate any longer because we're too close to an end decision now, and, and our terms have not been met. So we did try for three years to say, well, maybe if you did this, we could do that, or maybe, you know, but we haven't been able to reach any, any uh, compromise. So if we passed a motion uh, the same or similar, the one passed around, that would be a, a helpful thing. It would be lovely. I, it would really be great. It would really show some strength. I mean, what, whether or not we can stop this, I have no idea, but uh, strength in numbers. And as you can see by the list of supporters going around the table now, I, I think we're starting to really get some traction. And uh, we just want to be able to say to our kids, 20 years from now, we try, or hey, we stopped. One way or the other, at least show some strength and, and do what you think is right. And if you don't do it here today, at least do it uh, during public comment period is another opportunity. We prefer the motion, but we'd also like to see people really uh, <coughs> put their hand up in the air when the public comment period happens too. So individually that would be great. Right. Any other questions? See you at the moment. Thank you for your presentation. <sighs> Thanks. All right, uh, we had Betty Donaldson uh, down for a presentation today, but I don't see her here. Uh, so we'll defer, perhaps she'll be coming. She might think it's 5.30, that's a possibility. Yeah. So we'll just defer that for now. And just a quick question. Yes? So if we were going to put this motion on the agenda, it would be later on just to have it on a future agenda? Yes, yeah, it wouldn't be on today's agenda. No. No. Would we need to do that? Um, I think uh, typically when we receive a delegation's request for a, a, a motion, we would put it on the next uh, council meeting. Yeah. Okay. We'll put it on there for consideration. So we don't need to do new anything. Business. Okay. All right. So that yeah, that'll be next week. All right, uh, no minutes of uh, meetings or departmental reports. We have a number of staff reports. Starting at page 11, we have a report from the Recreation Director regarding uh, development of a municipal alcohol policy and a request for uh, essentially a, a support uh, to give to the expression of interest of DCLB Moved. Second. <coughs> so on that recommendation, uh, council support uh, expression of interest to BC Health and Communities for funding up to 7000 for development of a regional municipal alcohol policy. Any further discussion? Yes. So council just board. a question of clarification. There's no cost to us um, other than staff time working together to... I believe that to be the case here. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. And uh, good to see a regional approach to this as well, uh, particularly when it comes to playing fields and recreation centers. Consistent rules would certainly help. Um, anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion is carried. Thank you, staff, for bringing that forward. Also, under at page 13, we have the asset management policy. Staff are looking for approval of the policy as drafted. Move. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Yes, Councilor Price. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, on the first page, it says, as these assets age and deteriorate, the issue of how to manage them in such a way to ensure the full service life and that we have a, um, an ability to replace them. Um, and I think that's 100% what we should be doing. Is, is it possible, I guess is my question, given the amount of infrastructure that we have to accomplish that? Well, uh, we've heard discussion about life cycle before, our Director of Finance provided some information on that a few months ago, a few meetings ago, and it is a challenge for sure. Uh, there are ways and means to do it. Um, is it all going to happen in the next five years? No. It's going to be a long process. Um, I think we were looking at some creative solutions around uh, when 
certain debt issues are retired, that we can look at perhaps applying uh, some of those funds towards uh, asset replacement. You'll see in our budget discussion we are contributing to reserves in various departments, fire department, um, marina, and so on. So yeah, it's, it's what they call the unfunded infrastructure liability, and, and really uh, all we can do is keep trying and uh, do the best we can. And I, I'm confident with our finance department here that uh, we'll keep working away. Anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Just as an aside, I did see some indications that under whatever the new deal will be from the federal government um, for infrastructure funding that they are going to be looking at uh, municipalities that local governments that do have such a policy in place as, uh, if you will, a precondition towards funding. They want to see, again, that that concern on a life cycle basis is being addressed. So this is a good step forward, but it will be part of our budget discussions this year and the years to come. So. Uh, another policy to consider at page 15 is uh, workplace wellness policy uh, related to largely the uh, recreation center. I'm looking for approval on that. Mm -hmm. We've been seconded. Discussion? <coughs> uh, yes. I just had a quick question on the um, uh, providing it to nonprofits and private business. Um, I guess. I just wondered, this would be open to any non-profit in the valley and any private business. And I guess this, this is really to our benefit in that we'll get greater usage of our facilities. Is that how we... I believe that's the case. Uh, our recreation director and our CEO can perhaps comment further. Uh, there's, first of all, the employment wellness program, but then you're talking about the corporate one. Mm -hmm. This would apply to, I assume, any business and non-profit organization and it would include organizations like uh, BC Ambulance, uh, the paramedics, uh, for example, who have used the rec center in the past, uh, the Coast Guard uh, who have used it in the past, uh, assuming the military beasts, if they wanted to use our facility, they could, as long as they have, is a minimum of four? So it's four, yeah. Four employees, so it could be a small organization, as, as little as four that could do it. And uh, the passes, in that case, do provide up to a 20% reduction in fees, so. Hopefully that will encourage uh, others to get involved. I don't know if staff have any further comments on that. Uh, not really. It's designed to support local business and developing employee wellness programs. So uh, it's an easy way for them to do something for their staff. And uh, maybe we think it's a benefit to the community and a healthy party. And they'll be promoting it the way to the we have uh, put it out to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it goes throughout in the brochure, of course. Uh, we respond to some direct inquiries and uh, distributed to some of the people that have expressed interest over the past, like the um, school district in Mount Washington. And like that okay. Council Fletcher? I was just curious why a minimum of four was set, as there are often. Smaller home-based businesses of one, two people. So just wondering why they're minimum of four. Um, actually, we lowered it down. We're looking at the research that we did on it. Most of them have a minimum of five, you know, between five and ten, in order to make it beneficial to the, to the employer. Uh, I guess if you get down to one, if I'm a single business owner, not the only person, then I can come in and get the twenty percent discount. So that almost applied to everyone in some form. So we set something up that we felt was reasonable that would apply to most small businesses. And we're trying to get an average, but we did actually lower it than what we've seen in most of these types of programs. Yeah, so there's other passes individuals can get yes. in annual yeah. six months and so on. Anything further? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion's carried. Again, thanks to staff for bringing that forward. All right, into financial matters. Now we're at uh, page 23. We have uh, a report from our Director of Finance, timely as always, in terms of the 2013 assessment. And I'll motion to receive that report. Second. Uh, received that. All those in favor? Motion is carried. Any comments, questions? Um, you can see that uh, non market growth has been modest, in the words of our. Finance director, roughly 64,000 in the uh, 
tax base just through new housing and subdivisions, and uh, that reflects obviously a, a slower uh, new construction market. Um, other than that, I think everything else is relatively self-explanatory. So, yes? I, I just on page 25, uh, our treasurer mentioned around um, that department heads can verbally report at this time. We're not quite there yet. Okay. Oh. We're, we're doing that one next. Okay. So anything further on the assessment roll? Seeing none, then we'll move on to the next one here. So what we're going to be receiving tonight is the first draft of the five-year financial plan. And uh, motion to receive that would be ordered, and then we can have further discussion. Move. Second. Uh, receive that. In favor? Motion carried. So our Director of Finance has provided this information, and um, again, uh, it is a very much just a starting point, highlighting the fact that uh, there is some work to do to balance the five-year financial plan. Uh, currently, a $1.9 million uh, not to crack on that. We do have the expectation of a surplus from last year. However, those uh, need to be confirmed. And we're also looking at uh, other elements uh, in the budget that need to be discussed. As we've done the last number of years, started from a zero-based budget or core expenditure uh, approach. So on page 27, you can see what's being proposed in terms of increases. And uh, the various departments we did hear about, of course, policing uh, back a month or so ago. Talk a little bit about the organics collection program, and then the rest of it is uh, outlined there. There is a suggestion here by the finance director that we focus perhaps tonight's discussion on the revenue side, as well as the additional items which we can get reports on. Um, but this is very much going to be a work in progress over the next uh, three or four meetings, I would imagine. Committee as a whole, principal. Yes. So Barbara, you would like to, you had a question? Start? I just thought that was a, a good approach to hear in details. Um, I guess uh, on the organic bins, I did have a, a question. It, it does <coughs> sound that uh, getting the right bins uh, is important in the process. And uh, I was talking to somebody from the Nanaimo Regional District where they, they have, have it throughout the regional district in the rural lands and the urban areas. and. Um, and so I, I just wonder whether staff have had uh, the opportunity to talk to the solid waste manager down there, Carrie McIver. Yes. That's great. There's been a lot of discussion, perhaps the CEO uh, you know, and our director of finance, and Shelley, uh, Russ Martin, have been involved. So. We're, we're still in discussions with staff at our regional district in terms of how this program will roll out. And uh, I, think, I think at this stage, uh, the bins are going to a specific organics collection bin may be premature and because of the, the nature of, of the pilot and, and they're unclear as to the volumes that will be generated in terms of material. We are trying to see if we can make the uh, organics and yard waste combination work so that uh, it would be commingled at the curb with, into the yard waste bin and at least for this uh, one to two year trial period we'll see what types of volumes we get. So there is a, a very likelihood that we won't be utilizing that $180,000 at this stage. <coughs> and, uh, until we get more information from the regional district, uh, we're just, we're still in the holding pattern. Okay, that's great. So, uh, but we will be putting out information because I yeah. gather there's a very lot of stuff you can, like milk cartons and yes. a lot of uh, yeah. And, and I, I wonder whether it is worth, I know we've talked about gas tax money to buy them. I wonder if it's just worth asking the question of the people who control the gas tax, tax money because um, it, it does seem it should fit. And, and if people can have the expectation that they leave the bins behind, then we're not left with the problem that when people move, we have to look at how do we replace them. Yeah, it may be something you can check with the city of Victoria recently is uh, buying a bunch of those bins or I bought uh, Saanich is rolling theirs out as well. Uh, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel on that for sure. Yeah, so. is, is the R&D going to reduce the tipping fees for the organic waste? That's what we're hoping. That's, that's one of the things that we're looking at because uh, at, at the present time because our organics or yard waste doesn't go to the landfill, it goes to a different site, it would be... Uh, 
fairly hefty hit to us to participate in this program. So we're trying to find out, um, you know, that magic number that makes it work where they can accept our yard waste, our organics, and uh, see how the whole process work, works. Well, without our organics, the whole pilot project is for naught. Correct. Yes. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, staff have had considerable discussion with uh, solid waste staff, so that's still a moving yeah, as, as, as recently as this afternoon, we were having more discussions about uh, how we can make it work for Comox. And, and Cumberland is already there in terms of uh, their organics are collected, uh, or their yard waste, sorry, is collected and, and delivered at, at that price point that, that they have right So it's, it's a non-issue for them, but it's a, it's a significant issue for us as well as for the city of Courtney, who participates in the same program we do in terms of where our yard waste goes. So this is, it's important that we can make it work at this stage so that it can work for the greater. So is there anything that uh, Patty and I can do with the solid waste management? I, I believe that the regional district staff will be reporting that discussions are ongoing in terms of finding the solution with Comox. Okay. And uh, we'll keep you informed as to, uh, as to what the next steps are. But we, we do have time. Uh, because the at, at Pigeon Lake, where the site will be, uh, the site preparation came to a halt. Uh, they couldn't pave the area they needed to. So we're probably um, into May before the site is even ready. So we do have we do have the luxury of time. Right now. So it's safe to say that we wouldn't be rolling this out in February. Correct. And I think the rub on buying uh, the organic bins with gas tax money is that you have to own the infrastructure. So if you give them away, you don't own, own them anymore, and that's one of the criteria for gas tax money. Yeah. All right, well, uh, we'll let uh, staff carry on with those discussions, and that will hopefully ensue over the next few weeks when we get clarification on that element of the budget, at least. Um, in terms of policing, um, you can see that the five-year financial plan talks about uh, adding another RCMP officer in 2014, April 2014, and the costs associated with that are reflected over those years of the budget and the civilian support for staff members uh, in April of 2015. If you add those all together, you're close to $600,000 in terms of expenditures over the five-year financial plan. I think it's something we need to look at. The challenge that we have with policing uh, is that the cost drivers on those are largely out of our control. The cost for policing, as you know from previous presentations to this the council, are increasing uh, significantly. And the only way we can really control those costs is by the number of police officers and support staff that we support. So it's something, I, I'm not saying we have to make a decision tonight on, but something we need to look at, whether we want to carry on with that policy of one every, new one every four years, or whether we want to hold the line on that, um, take it out of the plan, what have you. Well, another factor to take into is that we could very well in the next census be dealing with paying for 90%. Right. You don't want to totally shock everybody <coughs> with a huge jump at that point either. So, I don't Well, you can see every officer that we pay for is a roughly going to be 120 to 130,000 uh, leaving aside support staff. So it's a significant cost. We pay for 10 or 11 right now, somewhere in there. So uh, that's a big part of our budget. Do we not always reconcile that at the end of the year with uh, time off and vacancies. and vacancies and things like that? And do we not generally end up in the positive on our police budget? And I know we talked about this last year, and I can't remember whether we rethought that or, or not last year. I can't. I think our director of finance will maybe comment on that. We often end up with uh, a surplus in policing because of staff vacancies. The problem that we run into is if we build that into our budget, and they reach 100%, uh, they fill all their any vacant positions, then all of a sudden they've overspent the budget. And uh, uh, we saw two years ago with the Olympics, suddenly this detachment was actually overstrength, right? It wasn't a single vacancy, and they had one or two hits to spare. So, uh, so there's no way to predict. That's the bottom line. Um, another, before we maybe go look at the 
other increases proposed to core operations, we should maybe talk a bit about revenues. Uh, our, C our Director of Finance has indicated on page 26 that the financial plan, for now anyway, uh, contemplates a 2.7% overall increase in the five years of, the, of the, uh, each of the five years. Of course, we did slightly better than that last year with less utility rate increases, but we, uh, we need to discuss that plus a slight reduction in building permit revenues. Um, we're hopeful recovery on that over time. I don't know if there's other revenue points that we need to discuss. Um, obviously, for new subdivisions and new construction, that does help our bottom line. We have been getting economic, uh, at least tax impact statements out of our new development proposals that the staff have provided. So, uh, of course, we're now we're, we're in, a, in a bit of a flat time in the market. So I don't know if there's any more discussion where council wants to go. Obviously, we won't get to a final number on this until we have looked at all the expenditures. But uh, that target of 2.7 is probably now above the rate of inflation these days. But it's something that reflects where we've been in the last year. Of course, we have fixed costs. Collective agreements and the like that uh, contribute to those, plus increases in the fuel and whatever else. Um, other than that, the council, I don't know how you want to proceed with uh, the rest of the, the budget discussion. We can certainly have comments from our fire chief, our direct director, or parks and public works and arena maintenance. They're all itemized there in terms of the proposed increases. CEO, how do you want to deal with this? Well, at this stage, we're happy to answer questions for clarification uh, that members of council may have. And as you mentioned, we, we uh, still have to finalize the financial plan with the year-end numbers, and that'll, that'll happen over the next few weeks. And so the next version of this document you see will be uh, more complete, and uh, then, then the, the tough decisions have to be made but at this stage. If there's more information we can provide you with that. Maybe we can start with the fire chief, pick on him first. Because he's right after policing. Tell us what that's all about. Well, we're looking for an adjustment in our five full time positions to uh, bump them up a little bit over the next few years to bring them a little bit closer to uh, some of the peer uh, fire departments in nearby areas. I uh, would also look for support in casual wages. These are firefighters we bring in from time to time after large fires to do a lot of clean up and stuff like that around the fire station. Uh, I'd like to see a bigger increase in what we've got here, but we know that we're restrained by lots of issues. So uh, that's a fairly modest increase there. Um, on, on the fiscal side, uh, the proposals are to increase the contributions to the fire department reserve by. 40,000 over the next five five years. There's one year actually it wasn't included. Um, what's that? About? That's um, for replacement for, for fire engines. We replace a fire engine every seven years and we try to reserve money for that so we don't have a large uh, bulk to pay. Typically the fire engines are 400000 to $500,000. And the year where there's no contribution to reserve is because that's the year we're buying the next uh, okay. uh, fire truck. And so that year, instead of putting money into the reserve, we put it into the truck, yeah. and we got and we had the other reserve that's been accumulated to that point. Uh, okay. Any questions for our fire chief? Uh, uh, yes. The only thing I'd like to add uh, to Ward's comments is that uh, because this is a shared service, it's essentially a joint venture between the town and the Comox Fire Protection Improvement District. Uh, Although in the budget, we budget for 100% of the cost, there is a revenue offset for their share. Okay. Thank you for that reminder. Any questions for Fire Chief? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll pick on Public Works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just going down the list here. Yeah, uh, just for some clerical work, um, uh, assistance will say like uh, our chief did a, like a full-time, but I'll take a half time at this point and we have uh, a lot of inspections and maintenance uh, operational reporting that we have coming in as part of the asset management as well where we get all this data but it's not being recorded uh, probably as best as maybe we could be doing it um, so we feel like there's a lack of uh, support there in the next two uh, Good. Any questions for 
show you. So just on the clerical when we were up to the <coughs> at the ER, would that mean like would someone would actually be in the desk there? Yeah, point? well the counter was in the back, so that's another thing as well for safety and having somebody there so somebody from the public does come. And then that goes back to as a management as well for level of service to the public when they come to, you know, the public works that they actually could be assisted by a person with the off chance that nobody is in that building. Further? Okay, we'll move on. We've talked a bit about garbage already. Uh, leave that one alone for now. Planning department, uh, Martin? Yes, um, this is in response to I mean, the um, strategic plan uh, of the council. One of the main things was to get our processing times down, keep our processing times down. So we've been able to do that um, through um, modifying some of our procedures. Which will continue. Also, in terms of if we do get spikes in development, um, being able to pull in additional resources in terms of temporary support, uh, support and also ensuring that we have coverage in the summertime and some of our simpler items leaving them to the summertime for us to, to, to do, which uh, provides a very cost effective way of doing that. So, we're going to be doing for two years um, out because it's about as far as accurately. Estimate um, to keep that float in place so that we have that ability to respond. And those two studies that you're referring to there, can you just explain briefly what those are? Certainly, the um, subdivision bylaw is um, we're getting better idea with the completion of the OCP um, and the traffic study in terms of the amount of detail that we're going to be in the subdivision bylaw. Um, primarily in terms of coming up with a made in Cromont solution on our roads, the cross standards, uh, cross sections uh, for traffic calming, ensuring things that it's suitable to all the other departments in terms of maintenance and public works, fire uh, protection that our vehicles can get through. Um, so we've revised our, gotten um, some additional cost estimates um, from engineering in terms of what would be required. That's the additional uh, increase in the uh, subdivision by a lot cost of $50,000. Um, the storm capacity, the, um, I'm sure you can better speak to that one. Yeah, you can just speak a little bit on the subdivision by a lot. It has like engineering standards in there as well, which I believe were done in the 1990s. So a lot of it is outdated. So the subdivision reversal <coughs> through is a lot of, you know, instead of just referring them to the subdivision plan, we have to do a lot of changes in regards to the things from post um, tells for the um, post that we want requirements or hydrants or that level of detail in the design. So it's a lot taking a lot of time from us to get that those standards and your standards up to date um, would be very helpful. Um, and the storm capacity is uh, part of the OCP because of the infill. It was just updating our model to see where we're at in infrastructure wise capacity upgrading or placing over construction. Okay. Any questions? Go ahead. I just had a, a, a quick question on the extra staffing. Um, just taking into account, you know, mentioned in our report that uh, there was lower than market growth for 2013 than was budgeted a year ago. So we're definitely seeing, I assume, less applications. We're seeing less happening on the ground. Will we be watching and to see if that's happening? I mean, if we're seeing a fall off in applications over time, if, do we really need to be increasing staffing? And um, and, I, and you've answered my question about the two years. I noticed it was just putting the two years. Is that that uh, if it does continue to fall, then that position would be terminated? <coughs> We'd reanalyze that at that time. I mean, what we're now done is we've, um, we've uh, reduced the position of building inspection. Um, and uh, that's, um, we see that as um, a long term possibility to maintain that reduction in building inspection. Um, so right now, the market's quite, um, quite a bit in a lull. We do know that given the projects that are before us, um, we have sufficient projects to staff busy, um, our existing staff busy for the entire year. And there are a number, for example, a number of projects that are kind of swirling out there like the hotel that would be quite um, labor intensive. Uh, quite unlikely that we could do the hotel.
until um, meet the eight month, um, six to eight month uh, processing timeline and our other commitments. Uh, we're right now uh, we're finding we're using up quite a bit of staff time on the Northeast Colon's and stormwater study. Um, we're also getting involved in terms of stormwater on additional stormwater requirements um, on the zoning on 1651 McDonald Road as it goes down through the back road. Uh, so there's that project that if we do hit that project then we may have to draw on additional resources so our intent is not to utilize those funds unless we get the projects in it's just that if they do come in and we don't have any um, any monies available to us we'll be back into the uh, same situation that we were in the past which is just the processing timelines that we start to extend them great thank you thank you for that Director Hines? Uh, I wanted to ask Marvin a question to kind of clarify. Would you say that the development proposals that we're proceeding now are more likely to proceed in the future generally are getting more and more complicated? Yes. We're, um, we're switching to infill, um, and there's two things that are going on. One is as we go into infill, um, there are custom designs on a site, and we're in response to the site characteristics. One of the problems that we're hitting currently in regards to our subdivision bylaws, we've got existing areas where we have roads um, and infrastructure that's below the current standards. So each time that one of these is coming in, we're having to do a custom design in terms of, well, okay, what, even though our current standard says this, this, and this, what, what do we really need? Because we have a, a very big gap in some area between what we have on the ground um, and what we have in our standards curb, gutter, even pavement with sidewalks. sidewalks. I mean, part of this is that recent applications like um, the Queen's application that came in where all of a sudden we don't have 9 meter um, road pavement, we only have 6 meter road pavement, we don't have a cul-de-sac. Um, <coughs> what about garbage trucks that come in? So that starts to bunch up quite a bit of, quite a bit of time uh, from the applicants and also from staff time. Um, so we have uh, so we have the outdated subdivision standards. Um, we have in terms of the, even in regards to greenfield development. So we're getting areas like northeast home lots for which we don't have existing comprehensive uh, engineering servicing plans. We also have in those areas, um, we're trying to reduce greener, less, um, less land to intensive housing forms. So those standards have to be customized and brought in. So we're trying to react to, to both that, and, and as we're doing that, what's happening is for the, the amount of labor that's going into these applications is increasing. Great. Any further for our planner, Professor Fletcher? Uh, so just with that in mind, uh, the, the building inspector and you know, the work that's, that's fallen under it may rise. The um, we can't reduce um, under the collective agreement. Um, we can't use contract in order to reduce our, our workforce, our employee workforce. So what we've done, so for example, so on building inspection, um, we do built in into this budget is uh, 1.3. The 0.3 allows us to draw on. Retired building inspectors have them come in and on any union position on a part time basis or on a temporary basis. Um, likewise, uh, last year, um, I think last year, last year we brought in on the planning side, we had a lot of a large number of applications um, very early in the year, so we brought in um, a uh, uh, planning technician to provide. Um, provides additional assistance, and then we had um, a student come in. Um, we had under the collective agreement to get paid uh, a portion of the planning <coughs> expedition uh, on the front counter. So that's how we we're adjusting. So what we actually foresee is um, with changes in processes and, and legislation, hopefully even if the economy picks up, we can maintain our one building inspector. Um, 
right at, at that kind of area. And we can we maintain it with that? Do we have the number of retired people available? That's always a challenge in terms of to buy that because we can't have that position empty for two days uh, or a week. Anything further on uh, planning? All right. Uh, we'll move to recreation. Uh, nothing happening over there, so that'll be great. <laughs> Um, there's three items on here. The first item that we're uh, looking at is uh, as you're aware, the, the uh, use of the facility has grown considerably, particularly in terms of the things. And at the present time, we don't have any programming staff that shift over those times. And we have a need to put someone on to, first of all, start probably coming in with that question to our programming. To support the instructors that are working at all time, and also we'll give some guidance and direction to janitorial and office staff. Uh, it's the area where uh, existing staff are coming back after the regular hours to try and fill in with the need exists, and uh, certainly it would uh, be a benefit to have full time or not full time, the part time program on the afternoons. That The other aspect of the position is we're looking at uh, trying to, uh, we've lost a couple of staff people because of the after school program. So we're looking at trying to focus on children who need after school, teams in the evening, teams of that nature to try and provide better service to that very true. So that would be a focus of this particular position as well. Um, regarding the other two items, the bulk of that increase is due to vacation uh, replacement and mm -hmm. relief staff. Uh, we don't budget 100% for us, so we have, uh, we have a lot of vacation entitlement. So we're budgeting probably about 90% or 80% of that for replacement and all those people are up on vacation. Uh, with the janitorial office, it's not an option for us. We have to replace those. We can't just say go on holidays and work out this issue. Well, it, it makes it difficult that way. The other thing is we've asked for an extra four hours for janitorial because the demand uh, placed on the facility and the equipment has required additional maintenance. And I, I have copies of the <coughs> fitness studio from 2012 and purple has changed between the other. So I have copies of the
26 years and one for almost 20 years. Uh, that's, uh, I'm not saying they don't work hard, they work tremendously hard, but their bodies are, are suffering as a result of some of that. Uh, we, we are gaining uh, a, little, a little bit more each year in terms of uh, uh, whether it be uh, uh, not necessarily a building, but certainly other buildings, uh, walkway components, uh, roof parks, playgrounds, all of these things that need attention and at times are terribly hard to find contract labor to take care of. Care of. Uh, as I stated earlier, we, we contract out an enormous amount of our building maintenance needs already, and uh, we will we'll continue to uh, retain the services of those uh, reliable companies that we've used. Uh, but we're feeling that uh, we're getting near the time that a third tradesman will be a great value. And then uh, I understand there's also a small increase for the marina and ten marina attendant hours. What we're finding <coughs> with uh, uh, the marina attendant's uh, uh, position is that with, uh, again, the increased popularity of the marina space in the waterfront and the need to facilitate more events, it's, uh, the demands on just hours are becoming a little more It's virtually impossible for us to uh, uh, to host, if you will, these types of community-based events uh, without some staff time and attention, mine included. I want to sort of hopefully step back a little bit uh, from uh, that role and, and concentrate on other things. Uh, you know, not saying I won't be there for them, I certainly will, but uh, finding that Jeff being down there, being uh, based there operationally, uh, it makes sense for him to uh, to help field some of those questions and answer the questions that come from uh, our community uh, groups involved uh, down there. We're finding that um, by increasing the hours in the springtime, it will alleviate some of the tension for him uh, because of the hours drawn away from the other events, and it will help him more uh, effectively manage the, uh, uh, the jockey for position and will with the voting public as it happens in the springtime. The spring, is, the, the spring is probably a little more fanatic than it is in the fall if we don't suffer severe storm um, patterns, uh, which, which can pull him away uh, from, from time to time. That's, that's the rationale behind uh, the, the modest increase in the hours at the time. Okay, and our finance director probably has any answers to questions written around the Marina Reserve and Butterfly Development Reserve. I think we're familiar with those already, but is that anything further to add? Not really. Uh, uh, I'll have a monthly uh, quarterly financial report soon uh, for December 31st to be able to see what the reserve balances are. Uh, we tapped into the Marina Reserve a couple of years ago uh, to uh, uh, redo the boat launch. Uh, so there's not a lot of money there. The, the flip side is that uh, we've got a comprehensive Marina survey uh, scheduled soon. And when that happens, we'll get a, a, a really good idea of what the life, residual life of the assets uh, is. And then we can really develop a, a more a less ad hoc, more st strategic way of uh, building up the reserves so that we know that when it's time to replace the facility, we've got the, the revenues we need. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> so am I reading this right? You built in a 2.7% tax increase into the revenue stream here? Well, Council in its 2012 yeah, financial plan. Okay. So for the fifth year of this one, for 2017, I also added 2.7 percent. But for 2013, in this revenue stream, you've got a 2.7 percent tax increase. Correct. Same as as 2013 and the last financial and there's, time, and there's still a shortfall of $651,000 for this budget. The way it's presented right for now. For this year. For this year. Yes. 
So that would be another 9.5% increase that you're asking for on top of the 2.7. Well, I wouldn't say that we're asking for that kind of revenue increase. I would say that we have to review our expenditures carefully. Well, and, and that's what I'm getting at because that ain't going to fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you worship, that's why we put 2.7% in. That was the, the figure that council approved in terms of revenue. And we, we don't know yet the final numbers on the surplus, so I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's it's premature to, we're, I'm sure, all hopeful around this table to keep it at 2.7. Well, that's but that, that means trying to peel out $651,000, which is subject to what the surplus may be yeah. carry forward. And uh, yeah, I mean, for example, we likely will be spending $180,000 on the bins. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, for subsequent years, we're going to look at policing and all that goes. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of work in progress for sure. Yeah. Well, I think until we know what that surplus is and what the true number is, I mean, this is a good introduction. Yeah, that's all we're doing. the problem, but I don't think well, there's a whole lot more we can do. I, 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 I guess what I wanted to point out, now that we have all the senior staff here and they've all got their budgets here, mm -hmm. uh, we, we can't increase taxes by 13% to give you this this budget. So rather than us trying to tear everybody's budget apart, I think you guys, as and you know, you guys as senior uh, staff members, have to go back and look at your budget and have a bit of sympathy on the council because you know you, you have to rejig your budget somehow. We, every department has to look at it again and figure out what we can really use and what we really, you know, what we really need or, and what's really a bonus because, you know, I look at this right now and I feel like just throwing my hands up in the air thinking, you know, I'm not going to try and find $651,000 in here. I, you know, we could, it's just not, it wouldn't be palatable to you guys if we tried to do that. So I, I guess I'm just asking you to come back with something that, uh, that we can all try and live with. Yeah, I think CEO has been working with uh, senior staff in that vein. Um, at this point, the expenditures uh, need to be looked at for sure. Mm -hmm. And again, um, once, once we know what the 2012 expenditures have been, then we can tip these down to uh, where we want to be. But, you know, again, this is an approach we've taken in previous years um, to show what the core is and then to have analysis done so that we get to that number. So yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I agree. Um, just the final comment over on page 28 around cultural expenses, uh, nautical days grants, you know, those are uh, increases that we're looking at. And again, uh, nautical days uh, is changing from more of a volunteer base to more of a Contract position, so, so that's what some of that's about. Yes, it is. And we have uh, also the increases in the reserve contributions, so that is what we've uh, been talking about in terms of life cycle planning. So, with that, I guess if there's uh, perhaps final questions for on this topic for now. We'll bring it back to you. Do we have any idea what the census might look like? Because that will have a big impact. Well, it definitely will. Um, I guess the director of finance is the one that's been working on that. Two dollars, two million. I mean, you, you between know. those two. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think he's been around long enough for not to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, there's a variety of adjustments that I make in year end. So today I posted. Uh, about $1.4 million worth of year-end transactions, right? And that will absolutely change the, the way things look at December 31st. So, you know, uh, until I get a couple of weeks further down the line, I'm really reluctant to pull numbers out of the air. Okay. I think in the interest of, of showing what the challenges are, I think this is certainly one approach uh, that this council has taken over the years. Other councils, local governments, have taken the approach of, okay, here's the number, give us the budget. Um, certainly, uh, the city of Courtney seems to do that. Um, that's another approach, but I think 
by having a bit of more back and forth on this, we understand what the challenges are and get to a number that ultimately council has to live with. And uh, hopefully that can be explained as well to the public as to where we're at. But yes, I think we're all hoping to keep it within that what's happening in Jordan's. How we get there is remained to be determined. Yes? Yeah, I, I think it's helpful to see the best wish list that they have and that we all understand as things have to be factored taken away, that we all feel it and understand it and recognize the impact that we're all in the field. Yeah, I see so you all leave you for any final comments on it uh, in terms of your dealings with staff and departments. Well, in, in you know, our final one was to go back and hearing some comments at, at this table uh, and have another look at this. And as, as Don refines the information as to what our new event is like, we'll have a better, better idea of what we're going to go So it's, it's not... Uh, one of our concerns was, was in bringing this was that it is a very preliminary look at where our financial plan is. And uh, although we don't want, we're not trying to induce panic or stress, we want you to understand as well that the demands that are that are on every department are, are there. And, and uh, we'll continue to work on bringing that number down. All right. So... With that, we'll uh, leave it for the time being. Uh, no specific recommendations uh, need to be made at this time, I think. And we'll see you in a couple weeks uh, with some further clarification on surpluses and the expenditures from last year. All right, so we do have now uh, Dr. Donaldson here. Um, you are uh, welcome to come to the front here and provide your uh, presentation from the podium. And uh, you have uh, 10 minutes for your presentation. Thank you very much. I was going to open by saying Happy New Year, but after listening to uh, the, uh, the budget to make wishes and constraints, I think I, uh, I'm going to say that uh, what I'm really going to offer you is an opportunity to, to think about the local town that you live in and to learn something about the residents' opinion uh, of the estuary. And maybe the, those, uh, that data will help you make decisions, at least it should uh, help you uh, um, understand the reason for you all sitting in this room. Tonight. Eddie, if you're able to come to the podium, uh, right. because so there's, there's actually a mic microphone there. Thank you, I need to hear that. Which we'll okay. pick up on. Then. So I have a, whoops, now I just need to find out some chili, how to work this piece and move forward. Really, um, Um, I appreciate very much you taking 10 minutes to hear a summary of a survey that Project Watershed sponsored that we completed about this time a year ago and uh, since then have been doing various presentations. I have been to the City of Courtney last fall. Um, you're the first one in 2013 and next week I'll be going to the uh, Regional District and um, then to Cumberland. And I've also presented uh, at various public fora and the Fish and Game presentation. Um, we did um, a survey that, uh, just to make sure we want to work this, that involved a number of volunteers, and a few of them are sitting in the room today. Um, some of them helped with interviews. We trained an interview team. And along the way, we acquired some of the new people who moved to the valley and called them Tiny. One of them usually comes to this presentation, but he couldn't tonight. He's Dr. Peter Sinclair, a sociologist that's retired from Memorial University. And at the time that I was critiquing the database, he came along and helped me with some graphs, so I credit him for that tonight. We've used a sociological approach here. And uh, before I go on, I want to thank the 187 people who participated, and of course, you, because you, this survey is a living document, and you are now part of our database, so we'll be. So, again, what we intended to do was to um, sample 10% of the residents who live along the estuary. And we deliberately avoided the current governance lines because they divide up the estuary, which is, uh, from a geographical and ecological perspective, one zone. So we ended up with three zones, and one is called Comox, and 33% of our database came from there. 
30% came from what we call the bridges area, and that is everything from the 17th Street Bridge through to Duff Creek, and the other 37% came from Courtney. And we did uh, door knocking and face-to-face -face interviews, and we defined residents as both the home address and workplaces. And so we door knocked here in Comox and elsewhere on single-family homes, multiple-family homes, uh, small businesses, um, not-for-profit organizations, and some public uh, um, uh, service addresses. Um, our objectives were to sample resident attitudes, to identify public knowledge, and to raise awareness about this unique environment, to provide information on, about the estuary, including its physical and cultural habitat, and to inform increased uh, awareness about the estuary habitat through voluntary participation in the survey, and then to disseminate the results. And we want to, if I will accomplish part of our project's goal if I've increased your awareness of what our survey was about by you thinking about the answers to questions. So, um, this is a map, and you have it in your, your database, and you'll see that there are several lines around here. Now, one line in red is the um, what we call and define as the, the, uh, the estuary, variously called the Comox River uh, Estuary, the Courtney River Estuary, the Comox Estuary, high tide lines, and I'm sure you're familiar with those boundaries. In green, we have what are the, uh, what is the survey. You'll see that we stopped in Courtney at the uh, Courtney Town boundaries. We didn't continue on, but in Comox, what we did was go up on the bluff and interview the sample there. We came all the way along Dyke Road, um, so we've got the regional district of Comox Band in this survey as well. And you'll hear results from all of those areas. Um, whoops, I keep going the wrong way. Must be because I'm left handed. So, my challenge to you um, I, I uh, have a background as an educator and a sociological researcher. So, how would you define estuary? So, think now, and then we'll find out how well your answers fit into the answers of the people who are in the survey. So, um, I'm not going to provide you with an answer right away. But there are many definitions of estuary, and one of them um, comes from Latin. And as you can see here, it actually has to do with the fertility cycle. One's attributed to the ancient goddess, the mother earth herself. And we tend to use a more scientific definition, a semi enclosed coastal body of water, which has a free connection with the open sea and within which seawater is measurably diluted with fresh water derived from land drainage. Why is that important? Well, it becomes important because people who were in the survey said things like this. Oh, the estuary is a gathering place. It's a gathering place for water. It's a gathering place for fish. It's a gathering place for grasses. It's a gathering place for people. And so our study title became A Gathering Place. And the person who gave us that name is a retired person who lives here in Comox. A beautiful answer. Um, I think from an estuary point of view, we should also know that out of 32 most important cities of the planet, 22 are built on estuaries. Estuaries are the incubator of life on the earth. It's life is easier and more beautiful here than any place else. And that, I think, puts a particular responsibility on those of us who live in the Comox Valley estuary because we live in the second most estuary in this province. And there are hundreds of estuaries along the coastal line, but ours is extremely diverse. And we wanted to know what people knew about estuary, what they liked most about living and working here, and what were their main concerns and any additional comments. So um, that's what I'm going to, uh, to summarize now, but I really do want you to understand how diverse our database was and how these people really do represent the people who elect you. They include all kinds of people, people with disability, RCMP, ambulance staff, retired public servants, teachers, drywall contra contractors, gallery owners, and many others who work in small enterprises. Um, our gender balance is 50-50, our home addresses were 54, multiple residences were 34%, and the workplace was 41. I'm going to go through this rather quickly because um, Shelley has this whole report on um, electronically and uh, also we points, and I'm hoping that when you get really bored or stuck down in your budget or other uh, things that you have to deal with this year, that you can take a break and look at these yourself on a more leisure basis. Um, this, I hope, hasn't faded too much, but it lets you know that our study was biased towards a more elderly population, not surprising, because if you think of the water side of Plymouth, the water side of Comox Road, inevitably it's going to be a, lower, uh, a higher age 
age population because young people with families can't afford to live in the most expensive places in the valley, right? Um, so they're not likely to be here. Um, time of the average, you can see that these people have lived here for a considerable time. Many have about, you know, almost half of our survey were here for more than 60 years in the same address, and then some of them have lived within the address. Here are their answers to what, uh, what an estuary is. And you can see that the greatest one is simply that, well, it's a place where the river and sea meet. And there was not very much understanding of why that was important. The fact that saline water and fresh water create a diversity at the ecological level that allows a biological diversity that makes many species thrive, including our own. So there's an ecological and a, an economic component to this study. Um, as you will see when you find out why people appreciate living here, and you can probably guess because you probably have some of the same reasons yourself. A few people gave us very sophisticated answers, and they understood the tidal and the basic flow. That was important. Some people really were quite ecologically sophisticated, and I, I might be able to, uh, to, to, uh, to find some answers in a minute, but I'm going to get that over here finished uh, first. And um, what was so interesting was a few people, people uh, gave us a geographical reference. Oh, I don't live on the estuary. I live on the bay. Said many co-ops residents. And if you lived in the zone of the bridges, the uh, zone, you said, well, I lived on the river. I don't live on the estuary. Well, the estuary is someplace down there where that fish or where that bird watching place is. I'm not on the estuary, but of course they are. And, and a few people said they didn't know. Many, many people uh, understood that the estuary has something to do with wildlife. One woman, she lives here, said, Well, I think they should fill in the sm mel um, uh, sm smelly, messy mud flats. They're just horrible, <coughs> but my favorite activity is going for coffee and watching the birds. <laughs> So she didn't understand that birds came down there for their kind of coffees. So these are some of the answers, and some of them are Comox people. Um, but this one at the bottom is the estuaries of swamps at the end. Um, and salt water meets fresh water, forms marshlands, wetlands, and people who live for a while can talk about marshlands, inlands, and tidal waters. Wetlands, used by more than one participant. Wetlands has a particular meaning, um, and is particularly important if what we want to do is make sure that this is only about a person. One Comox female said, well, an estuary is the lungs of the earth. These people are less scientific and more appreciative of the aesthetic parts. And uh, another person who was a Comox said, the area surrounding the Courtney River is tributaries and boundaries determined by changes in flora and fauna from marine to arboreal. It's quite a sophisticated answer. And as you can see, uh, uh, people wherever they lived around the estuary, they gave beautiful answers indicating how much they love it, uh, how much they love it. These are some of the other answers. Estuaries and Long Dyke Road, or I live on the bay. I love the birds, fish, occasionally seals, very to image the other species. Where the ocean meets the river, there's lots of love. A protected place, a place to come day to rest. And the idea that the estuary was protected came through time and time again, but in fact, as we all know, the estuary not um, This shows you some of the variances in the answers uh, by geography. And um, you can see that um, the Comox residents were more enamored of the view and uh, less prone to give us ecological responses. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, geographical base tended to be more narrow than uh, St. Bridges or side when we have the river walkway. Um, people love the wildlife. Crime is large. What Comox residents mentioned first was the view and the birds that you watch. So these responses were from a poor minority to those struggling to give any kind of um, definitional answers. Our conclusion uh, with respect to estuary, estuary residents have very little awareness about the biodynamics and very little understanding that this not legally protected habitat, but one of risk from a variety of threats. In this respect, they probably not much different than most people living in the country. What do we like? We love the view. Particularly the Comox people who love the view. Wildlife, by which they mostly meant the migrating birds. Um, recreation site, by which they mostly meant the air 
Park over at Courtney. Um, workplace. The unexpected finding of this study was how many people chose to work in an, uh, an estuary related area because it enhanced their work life. From Comox, we got several people, and they were back in the who said, I stop always at the pool in when my phone rings. That's where I have a salesman and I answer my calls because I can sit there and watch the birds. And another one said, I've got a very pressure job and I always sit there to unwind before I go home and before I go to the office. Another employer said, it's healthy for our staff when they can see the view from the office window. They're happier and they work better. Betty, and a few people say they're running right. about 15 minutes now, so Whoa. five minutes over okay. right. the allotment. Really, you have... Uh, I'll really hurry up. Um, I won't... Uh, I'm going to go... We, we did, by the way, all get by email the uh, summary. Okay. So I just want to say that um, from a Comox perspective, what people were most concerned about was land and going and the watershed impact. What people talked about over in Comox more than any place <coughs> else it was not so much transportation issues last year, but was the fact that they were worried about there was no place to clean boats. Boats were cleaned all over town, and the stuff was sludged all over the place. Um, the, um, people were concerned about pollution, particularly the marina, boat storage, boat pumping, uh, cleaning house of concerns, and the um, sawmill came up. People would love to see an air park in terms of standard, call in numbers, blogs. These are not expensive things to do. Science to protect wildlife. The fact that you don't have easy access to the water is a problem. You know that. And what they really wanted was something that would be a little bit more identifiable as a trail. Some people said they cut back blackberry bushes on their own. Um, some people said, why can't we walk along the streets and have a uh, foot? Uh, prints along the road with a map that shows us how to walk and make it more of a walking zone. Some people said, why can't we build something out into the, the water where people can go and look? And of course, uh, here's one of the better answers. Acquire the Lafarge site. It's not fundraising to get the field sawmill site. Support force your walkway easements, um, even if you have to wait for people to die. Gas and go was, at the time we collected it, a big issue, particularly here. And I will say that people mentioned models to consider. They mentioned Big Hill, Victoria. They mentioned the Campbell River Estuary. They mentioned Pollock and 17 kilometer shoreline walkway. These are good models for us to consider as we think about how we want to attract people to come to our valley. Triple A response they're awake. They're not very aware. It's time for action. I think you've received the CRIP, the Courtney River Estuary Management Plan. You know that volunteers uh, form steam keepers groups such as in Brooklyn Creek. We have river and shoreline cleanups that are volunteer. We need more zone discussions and monitoring. And I think it's an awfully good way to start 2013 by thinking about the environment, the estuary, and your economic uh, constraints. Courtney residents, I wish you good luck for the year. Thank you for having us here. All right, thank you. Uh, questions from members of council this time? I know, as I say, we did receive your material. Uh, email, so appreciate you bringing that to us and bringing us your presentation. I just one quick question. Uh, was there any uh, thought to creating the estuary as a wildlife management program? I know that's been raised in the past as a, as a way to focus on the actual uh, values of the estuary. Absolutely. People would love to see a more coordinated approach. And I think that, to be honest, I think we're easy that way to work that both at the volunteer level and at the council level and at the staff level. I just want us to remember to keep uh, the goal in mind. Biodiversity is a sensitivity point. We lose it, it's a lot more expensive, a lot harder to get back. And all of us are here. We don't want to threaten our own species as well. So <coughs> thank you. All right, thanks a lot. All right, uh, no correspondence. Uh, we are having a brief in camera meeting after this meeting, so motion to exclude the public under section 90. Second. Second. All in favor? Motion is carried. We'll have a brief adjournment. Uh,